All right. Good morning and good afternoon. Good evening. Maybe good very, very early morning or middle of the night to wherever you are. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the second day, second day of, of the Zero Carbon Conference 2023. I am Kaya Saramaki and I am representing Karelia University of Applied Sciences and Enoskunet Association and together with the Nagano Prefectural Government and University of Eastern Finland, we are organizing this, um, this uh, zero carbon conference for the second time now. Um, yesterday, we had a great day. Uh, we had presentations about mitigation, about how to minimize CO2 emissions and um, uh, things related to that. And today we will go into adaptation to see how we can adapt to climate change as it is already happening and what are the actions that can be done. Um, we have about 900 registrations to the conference from approximately 40 countries, and it's very nice to see that we have uh, we have a broad broad uh, variety of uh, participants uh, listening and and um, having thoughts in their head head about um, zero carbon issues. Uh, the presenters today will present a variety of, um, uh, we will have a, a variety of experts, including students, of course, and the geographical scope of the presenters is also broad. We have presenters from Latin America, from Africa, from Europe, and from Asia. We will start with, with a short speech from, from Irmeli Mustalahti. She is a professor at the University of Eastern Finland and she works, uh, works uh, on the issues of natural resource governance. Um, and she's also the vice chairman of the board for Enoskunet Association. Um, she has a PhD in participatory forest practices and impacts. And she has worked, uh, worked in, in, in research projects in Finland, in Europe uh, and, and around the world. And uh, I will share my screen now. Um, her um, speech is recorded. And uh, let's hope that I can uh, show it the way that we want to show it. We have had some technical difficulties, so uh, please, please bear with us if we have have some more still. I will share my screen still. I will wait for it to show. Can you see the screen? I think so. Yes, we see. Hello, everyone. My name is Irmeli Mustalahti, and I'm Professor of Natural Resources Governance in University of Eastern Finland, and also the Vice Chair of uh, Eno School Net Association here in Finland. And uh, also, I have been involved in a youth research project called All Youth here in Finland, uh, which we have been studying the issues related to climate activists, youth participation in the society, youth participation in governance. And what we have learned during this six year study is that youth role is very important in our societies. Youth and so-called intergenerational co-learning between the young people and the adults, it brings the new knowledge and understanding related to multiple crises in our society. Once we talk about the climate governance, uh, you might think that the youth, while they are demonstrative and sometimes participating quite ac ac aggressively towards to the climate actions, you might think that it's the negative, but how we understand it, it's a very important way how the youth have been increasing the discussion over the climate crisis. Their actions during the international negotiations and during their active role in the Barrios movements, as Friday movement here in the uh, demonstration in the various countries in Europe. It's have increased also our, our adults, our decision making knowledge 
what are the values and interests of the young generations in the future. Young generation, they have a new type of knowledge and understanding through their schools, but also various voluntary activities and hobbies. And they understand the sustainability, climate change, and the environmental degradation in the various ways, and of course, in the differently sometimes than adults and the decision makers. That is the important way how they are impacting the decision making through their own understanding, but also while they are involved in the society and the governance and the decision making, they also create the new skills to be part actively in the society. And once they are the adults and the decision makers, they are able to make a responsible decisions which have a very long lasting impacts in our societies. Thank you. That was uh, Irmeli, Irmeli Mustalahti from the University of Eastern Finland and Enoskunet Association. Very important issues on, on how to uh, or how important it is for, for the youth to participate in, uh, in, in the uh, climate governance, in the natural resource governance. The next speaker we have is uh, Sari Koivula. Uh, she will uh, shortly present to you uh, about um, climate climate issues here in North Karelia. That's the uh, region where we are located here. And uh, Sari has a PhD in forestry in diversity of ground vegetation in management managed boreal forests in relation to the properties of the tree stand and site. And she works as a climate and forest expert at the Regional Council of North Karelia. And I will share my screen again. And. Cool. I was asked to tell you some. Hello, I am Sari Koivula and I am working as a re in regional council as a forest and climate expert. I was asked to tell you something about this climate change and North Karelia issue. To answer this question, how to fight against climate change, mitigation and loss of biodiversity. In North Korea, we see that we need to decrease consumption, decrease emissions and sustain and increase carbon storages and sequestration. So we need all these three elements to be able to answer and handle that question. And why it is so important to decrease the emissions? It's simply that no carbon sink is able to save the situation alone. If we look at this picture of Harald Mauser from European Forest Institute, there is on EU level the carbon sink and car uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. And when we are looking at the carbon sinks, we see that we are talking about millions of tons. But when we are looking at emissions, we are talking about billions of tons. So that means that the gap is so huge that by no means we have no possibilities to have the amount of carbon sinks that should be needed. What is then decreased consumption? How we do it? We need energy saving and efficiency, very current question at the moment, at least in EU and in Finland, in a cold country. We need to uh, increase possibilities and also thinking of circular economy. That means, of course, that the products need to be uh, made to last and repair. And the one thing that it is quite difficult actually is this fashion for decades or years, not for one year or one week, but we need to create a fashion that is uh, current more than one year. And then decrease of emissions. 
of course, we need to increase the amount of renewable energy production and use of it. We need to get rid of fossil materials and we need to have more clean production. And then this sustain and increase carbon sequestration and storages, that is something that we are actually really good in North Karelia. We have climate smart uh, forestry and also nature management has been introduced to uh, forest management. That means that uh, we can increase the amount of dead and decaying wood, standing and fallen trees. We can uh, increase amount of deciduous tree species. Uh, we can add living spaces for game. We can protect valuable biotopes and habitats by leaving protection areas around them, etc. So no, we know how to do it. <clears throat> the implementation is still in phase, but we are forwarding, enhancing it. Then uh, we should re-establish where destroyed. For example, if some valuable habitat has been destroyed, by accident or whatever reason, it should be established, restored. And then restoration and protection where needed is of course really important. We need to protect valuable habitats, valuable biotopes, valuable species and the uh, environment. But it also means that we should protect the right issues. If we need living spaces for herbridge uh, species, species that live on rich forest areas, if there is no use to increase protection of dry forest sites, for example. Then what mitigation adaptation in North Karelia means? How we do it? We created climate and energy program aiming for 2030. It was published in 2021 and last year we published implementation plan for the program. The aim is huge and challenging. We need to reduce the emissions by 30% to 2030 comparing to year 2007. This means really huge amounts of emission reduction from almost 1,700 kilotons of um, CO2 equivalent to 3,500. And even if we would be able to put the biggest so uh, sources of emissions to zero, it's still not enough. So it means that we need to be able to reduce throughout the whole system. We need actions in all sectors. In the next slide, slide there are uh, a table of those emission resources. Implementation plan then contains actions for mitigation and adaptation, both of these, and it is monitored and renewed yearly. Some examples, enhancement of distributed energy production, of course, based on renewable energy, it should be easier for those who are willing to do it. We should have uh, investments to that we need to support them uh, by public money and we need to make it easier to apply uh, permission for this distributed energy production. Then we need investments on low emission traffic solutions. This is this is really crucial for our region because we are a region of long distances and poor public transportation. That means that we really need uh, private cars and the only way to reduce emissions in those are like moving to biogas or electricity. Then sustaining carbon storages and sequestration and maintaining biodiversity by the means that I presented previously. We are pushing green cities, more carbon sequestration, more trees, more green to cities so that also they take part to this task. We are aiming for climate resilient construction, buildings and living. This goes for, for example, uh, wood construction, but also that these buildings are using renewable energy. Uh, people who are living there have uh, their services near them so that they don't, for example, need to travel 
uh, to have for a doctor or go shopping. And in that way, we can reduce the emissions of traffic, for example. Then resource efficient business and sustainable nature management. This means, of course, resource efficiency and uh, recycling. And then these greenhouse gas emissions that I promised to show you. The biggest ones here are transport in roads, ro uh, traffic on roads, then agriculture and work machinery. All of these are important. They are crucial for our region. So we really need low emission solutions. Uh, there is no question the solution is not to, uh, to stop agriculture. We need food production. We need uh, possibilities to live also on rural areas. So we just have to figure out how to do it with low emissions. And same goes to these roads and work machines. For work machines like tractors or trucks, biogas is one good solution. And then the biggest uh, changes, reductions, since 2007 has been done in consumption energy, heating with electricity, and then railway transportation. So also positive development has been done. So far we are on the level about 35% reduction. So there's a lot of to do. And then I was asked to tell you something how youth are taking into account in our climate change work fighting against climate change. Youth organizations were invited to participate to the establishment of this uh, climate and energy program. And it was presented in high schools and other occasions involving young people. We had really good discussions and we added those uh, issues that they thought are important to that program and also to implementation plan. And the role of youth to our point of view is crucial because you are the decision makers of tomorrow. It's important that you participate to public discussion and you are member at that you have memberships and influencing in different councils and NGOs. And then we need to create straight conservation, conservation possibilities with uh, decision makers of today and youth and University of Eastern Finland is doing quite, quite nice work in that. And I think that you have a presentation from there. And then youth is important also in consumption now and in the future. You as well, we all, but especially you because you are active in social media and things like that. It's in, important to influence by example in real life and in social media. And we all need to get away from one day and cheap fashion that is usually purchased from internet and reducing transportation and packaging materials, etc. Eating food, food is important part. Are we eating at McDonald's or other fast food or are we making the food ourselves from the raw materials produced near us? And what is our attitude to disposable goods? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sari, from the Regional Council of North Karelia about what we have been doing for, for climate issues here, here in North Karelia in the past years or so. We will then next go through a little bit about how, how this um, conference goes. Um, in the conference, uh, we might not have time for uh, for questions and answers, and most likely we will not. And we have uh, decided that all the questions and answers will be um, given in, in Padlet. And you can find the link for Padlet in the chat box. Um, 
and also uh, for those who are in YouTube, it is in the description of the of the recording or the live stream as well. And once I switch to the Padlet, uh, it will have the QR code also, so you can scan it from from there while I'm explaining how how the Padlet works. Uh, all of you are invited to post questions to to the speakers, and also. Um, uh, the speakers will be uh, coming there uh, during the conference day and within the week or so from, from the conference itself to, to reply to the questions as well. Um, the link is now um, uh, in, in the chat box. Uh, you can go, go there yourself also, but I will share my screen and show you how it works in case you are not familiar with, with uh, Padlet. So this is what it looks like. It's, um, it's an online system and also uh, you don't need to log into it if you don't want to. But if you want to want us uh, and want everybody else to see what kind of comments you have written, you can log in uh, into, the, into the system uh, using your Google, Google accounts, your Microsoft account or your Apple, uh, Apple account. Uh, by default, it most likely will go to the anonymous uh, version, and if you want to uh, switch to um, to logging in, you can click click the top right here. It has some kind of an alien ant or something there uh, as as a means for anonym anonymity. So you can go there, and then you can choose to sign up with your Google or your Microsoft or your Apple account, or you can sign up with an email. And then from here, you can see whether you are logged in or not. And uh, the only thing that it um, affects is that if you are logged in, when you write something here, it will show your name also. If you are not logged in, it will show you as anonymous. Um, you can uh, comment to each of the speakers separately here from any of these, for any of these, um, just as a text, um, I will, I will uh, write here something and then just enter and it will show show there. You can edit your own comments and you can also delete your own comments, but not not the other other people's comments. So you can uh, tick tick the um, three dots there and you can either edit or delete your own comments. Uh, very simple, very clear. Uh, and uh, remember to post your comments in English. Uh, and also, if you need to scan the QR code, if you have your camera with you just at this very moment, you can scan it from there as well. But the link is also available in YouTube and, uh, and in the chat box here in, uh, in Zoom. Next, we will go on with the, pro um, with the program. And our next speaker, or our first, uh, first um, or, or the keynote speaker for today, uh, is uh, Felix um, Kalaba from the Copperbelt University in Zambia, in in the southern part of Africa. Uh, he's an associate uh, professor there uh, in uh, environment and development at the Copperbelt University, and chief technical advisor for EnviroSmart Solutions in Zambia. He's also been a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Climate Change, the IPCC sixth assessment. Uh, I will be sharing uh, Felix's uh, presentation from my computer and um, Felix will be going through it. So I will switch my own camera off and uh, share his presentation and then we can start in a bit. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for spending time uh, to did, uh, participate in this uh, conference. And I'll be sharing uh, my uh, presentation. So I'll just wait for it to be uploaded. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you so much again for the wonderful uh, presentation uh, overview of who I am and just uh, so that we can get to know each other. Next slide, please. Uh, Zambia has been experiencing uh, climate change impacts and uh, these have been diverse. This includes droughts, they include floods, uh, high and high temperatures. So these are uh, impacts have been negatively affecting the agriculture sector in Zambia, and largely because the agriculture sector in Zambia is largely dependent on uh, rainfall. It is rain-fed agriculture. It is interesting to note that within sub-Saharan Africa, 95% of agriculture is actually uh, rain-fed. So if it is rain-fed, then it means that uh, it is uh, highly affected by the negative uh, fluctuation of, uh, that climate change uh, brings about. The government has demonstrated uh, commitments to address the impacts of uh, climate change. And uh, this uh, can be seen in the National Determined Contribution, the NDCs of Zambia. Zambia has uh, uh, pledged to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 25% uh, using internal resources and, sub uh, and uh, or 47% uh, by 2030. The 47% comes in if the substantial uh, support from uh, other partners. And uh, we see government's uh, commitment in trying to address issues within the agriculture sector. Now, why? It's because the agriculture sector is impacted by climate change. But on the other side, uh, you find that um, the agriculture sector is also a driver of uh, deforestation and uh, forest degradation and has been identified as one of the key uh, drivers. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. It seems to be a bit slow. Okay. okay. I already mentioned that in Zambia, agriculture is uh, largely rain fed, meaning that you depend on uh, rainfall. And it is important to note that we have the rain season, which starts around about uh, November, uh, running up to just about March. But uh, with uh, climate change, you find that the rains are coming slightly later and ending early. And most of the agriculture is uh, not uh, mechanized. And uh, most of uh, the farmers depend on uh, a government uh, program where government provides subsidies under the food uh, input supply program and this uh, food in input supply program you find that the main crops that are grown under this program is uh, is maize and soybean but it is important just to note that uh, now there is an interest in growing other crops now agriculture is largely a uh, conventional uh, it's probably it's conventional agriculture a conventional farming with the common crops being maize sorghum millet sweet potatoes beans cassava as well as other horticultural crops. Now, if you were to look at the importance of the agriculture sector to the national, uh, to, to, to the nation in terms of the global, uh, the GDP, you find that um, uh, the, the, the agriculture sector contributes 9% to the uh, GDP, and it's also a main source of income for rural households. And the statistics show that in Zambia, um, over uh, 70 uh, to 80 percent of the food that is available is actually grown by uh, small scale farmers and not necessarily commercial uh, farmers. Next slide, please. So as we, as, as we think of um, agriculture, obviously I've said that uh, largely it's conventional agriculture that is being practiced, which leads to the destruction of soil structure, it leads to soil erosion, uh, disturbing as well as death of soil organisms. Uh, it, and uh, with conventional agriculture in the long run, this leads uh, to, uh, to reduction in yields. Why? Because uh, the, uh, the, 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 the fertility of the soil is actually lost. The other thing that you notice with conventional farming in Zambia is uh, increase in occurrence of pests, which are, affect the crops. There's also destruction of forests, where shifting uh, uh, cultivation or shifting slash and ban is, uh, is practiced. And as it is practiced, it uh, contributes to emission of uh, greenhouse gases and worsens uh, the impacts of climate change. 
So it is important to note that climate change has got its own negative impacts, but the activities that human beings are, uh, are involved in, even including in the agriculture sector, are actually exacerbating or, or increasing the negative impacts of climate change. Next slide, please. So what are some, what is the summary of these impacts of climate change that you are currently experiencing in Zambia? One, declining rainfall in the, uh, the rainfall and uh, reducing rainfall season. Now I've already alluded to the fact that uh, most of the agriculture here in Zambia and uh, sub-Saharan Africa is dependent on, rain, on rainfall. So it's rain-fed seasonal agriculture. As a result of the declining rainfall, this has, is having negative uh, impact. The other challenge is the frequent drought and dry spells. So they are increasing droughts in the region as well as dry spells. Now with dry spells, you will find that uh, you have the normal rains, but they just delay in terms of uh, the days that uh, you have rain. So you find that you have a dry spell at a critical period. For example, uh, plants are supposed to germinate and during that period of time, maybe there's a dry spell and the rain only for maybe a couple of weeks later. So this leads to the death of, uh, of, of, of the seeds. So we have frequent floods and uh, this year we had several floods and uh, agricultural fields washed away. There's increasing in temperature, occurrence of insects. Uh, ultimately, these are leading to reduction in crop yield and uh, production of maize. Now, maize is a very important crop because uh, it gives us this, it's a stable crop and it gives us a stable food. So therefore, the reduction in the production of maize is actually having a lot of negative impacts where food security is concerned. And ultimately, there is also the reduction in the GDP and uh, household uh, welfare. So meaning that even the income that households get is actually reduced. Next slide, please. So declining rainfall season, which I've already alluded to, the duration of the rain season has reduced over the years. The climatic conditions have become now less predictable. And there's very little early warning systems that uh, are available. And the production period has therefore reduced. High yielding varieties, such as late maturing maize varieties, are, however, can uh, not grow in some areas. So you find that some of the high yielding varieties can no longer grow in uh, some areas, but they can only grow in other areas. Now, I'm providing this background so that we can see the agency of um, looking at uh, practices that will help us adapt to climate change. Next slide, please. With drought and dry, uh, dry spells, uh, one thing that we just need to emphasize is that the availability of water in plants affect the plant physiological processes. So once you have uh, a dry spell, not necessarily a drought, but a dry spell, what will happen is that the physiological processes within the plant are going to be affected. And then this, therefore, consequently uh, leads to the uh, uh, reduction of uh, production. So production reduces. Droughts affect availability also of underground water. And farms that are running on boreholes for irrigation are also irrigation are affected. And these are largely large scale farmers. Rivers also are drying up. And this is affecting animals, where you see an increase in disease burden for maybe some diseases. And this also affects pasture and fodder quality, as well as quantity. So the fodder which uh, animals are supposed to uh, feed on is reducing in quantity, as well as in quality. And by quality, we mean the, uh, the nutritional uh, uh, content. Why? Because of the uh, physiological pro processes that are actually being uh, affected. Next slide, please. With floods, I must mention that uh, with, uh, with, 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 with floods, uh, what we experience in many is the washing away of uh, uh, crops. And this is happening at a great cost to the farmers because they would have prepared the land. They would have uh, spent a lot of uh, money uh, in, in taking care of the crops. And when floods come, they end up being uh, negatively affected. And then this leads to soil degradation and then it also leads to cause and uh, to, to causes death of uh, livestock. Next uh, slide, please. 
So from floods, we move on to increasing temperatures, where increasing temperatures are affecting also the physiological uh, processes of plants, as plants tend to weather, animals are also negatively affected, and they're also uh, stressed, and uh, the parasites also flourish in warmer conditions. So you find that the conditions are becoming now favorable for the parasites to, to, to flourish. Now, this leads us to the next slide. Next slide, please, where we see the occurrence of pests. Where with the occurrence of uh, pests, we, this is linked to temperature. As temperatures increase, weeds, insects, parasites, also, and other diseases will thrive under these conditions, and the controlling them becomes a challenge. We have seen new diseases and insects that have been recorded and have become very difficult to control. Uh, one example is the four army worms that are, 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 are ravaging the country, Zambia. There's also another disease called Tuta absoluta. So this is one of the diseases that uh, eat uh, tomato uh, fields. Wind also contributes to the spread, obviously, of pests. Uh, wind also damages you know, the uh, farm infrastructure as well as uh, crops. And uh, the cost of production has therefore uh, increased due to the number of inputs that are needed for you to control uh, pests. You need to buy uh, uh, a lot of heavy, uh, 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 insecticide and uh, pesticides. And this is actually now adding cost to agriculture. Okay, next slide, please. So this therefore now leads to reduction of uh, crop yield. And I must mention that all these negative impacts of climate change are leading to the reduction of uh, crop yield and also reducing food security as well as uh, nutritional security. Next slide, please. As these reductions are seen, we therefore now also see um, a reduction in the contribution to GDP, contribution to the income of the nation. Next slide, please. As production uh, uh, reduces, the contribution of GDP also reduces, employment creation is affected. Now, this is important because we're looking at a country where unemployment levels are very high, household income generation reduces, and uh, household welfare also reduces. So in view of all these things that are happening, how then is adaptation uh, taking place within the agriculture sector? Next slide, please. In terms of the agriculture sector, there are a number of interventions that are being put in place. One of them is the promotion of agroecology. Now, with agroecological uh, principles that are being promoted, we're trying to look at uh, how can we use seeds that uh, are, are, are used maybe to, uh, to, to, to the region. How can we uh, ensure that we reduce on, on tillage? So the agroecological uh, agroecology is where we engage in uh, various uh, practices that uh, uh, try to, uh, to, 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 to maximize on the current uh, environment and reduces on the use of uh, uh, pests. Then the other uh, thing that is being uh, 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 promoted is uh, climate smart agriculture. Now, with uh, climate smart agriculture, we are basically looking at uh, what are the current agricultural uh, conditions that we, we, we have, and then you start saying what um, mechanisms uh, can, put, uh, can be put uh, in, uh, in place to help uh, adapt to climate change. So a number of uh, interventions are, are, are at the moment uh, are taking place in Zambia, and uh, we see a number of uh, 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 firms that are supporting this among, uh, among development uh, agencies. So they are all promoting uh, uh, climate uh, uh, smart uh, uh, agriculture. And then there is also promotion of agroforestry. Now, agroforestry, we are looking at uh, agroforestry uh, practices, and with agroforestry, we are trying to have more of an integrated system where you retain agroforestry uh, agro tree species. Now, agroforestry is now contributing both to adaptation and mitigation. One of the tree species that is being promoted is Phydelia albida, which is referred to as a fertilized uh, uh, tree species. And uh, this is actually helping uh, in improving the soil, uh, soil. But not only that, there's also now the integration of animals on agricultural land so as to ensure that uh, uh, the, 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 the manure from animals can then be used in agricultural, in, in agricultural fields. Then the other thing that is also being uh, uh, promoted now 
is um, organic, uh, organic uh, farming. Now, with organic uh, farming, this is uh, being done on, uh, on, on, on a small scale. Now, one of the things is that when you look at organic farming, um, the, the biggest uh, uh, challenge that a number of people are, are, are having is actually um, labor costs because with organic farming, it has with its own, uh, it comes up with its own, uh, own, own uh, costs. So I must mention that uh, with um, these methods that uh, I've just uh, mentioned, with climate smart agriculture, it is very integrated also crop land, uh, crop land you know, you're looking at livestock and you're looking at forests and fisheries, which are more like integrated. But all these methods that are, are, are now being promoted even at the national level are more looking at an integrated way so that agriculture is no longer seen as an independent area, but you need to integrate it with uh, livestock, with forests and so many other things. Now, this is seen as a way of actually building the resilience of agricultural systems, which presently are very vulnerable to the negative impacts of climate change. And uh, these adaptation uh, methods that are, are, being util are being promoted uh, are quite helpful in that. Next slide, please. Now, what you see here, there is just uh, uh, one of the fields where uh, uh, these practices are being uh, promoted. Now, this is in the southern part of the country where uh, they are experiencing a lot of droughts, re reduced uh, precipitation. So what you do in this case, if you can see from that picture, they have planted the orchard, uh, planted uh, some oranges there, and um, you plant them in such a way that you maximize uh, in, in the whole so as to maximize you know, the, the water. So you do a little bit of mulching, you want to maximize the water. So one thing that we need to draw lessons from this picture is just the fact that different conditions will require maybe maximizing on water. In other places that are prone to flood, you may need to actually open up the area so that the water easily drains. Now, in view of the negative impacts of climate change, as well as uh, um, the methods of, of, of adaptation within the agriculture sector that are being uh, 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 promoted, what are some of the conclusions that we can draw? Next slide, please, as we conclude. We need to first of all understand that uh, various climatic stresses are happening and hitting the agriculture sector. So there are places where there are droughts, there are places where there are floods, there are places where there's high temperature, there are places where there's even low uh, temperature. So understanding the different climatic stresses as well as the, the projected risks for the future are critical to inform the agriculture sector and agricultural practices. We need to promote adaptation intervention. And these adaptation interventions must be in line with the various climatic uh, 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 stresses that uh, 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 are being uh, experienced in different areas. We, in the agriculture sector, we need to strengthen early warning system because for adaptation to work effectively, there's need for early warning system to be uh, uh, to, to a lot of investment in early warning systems, which at the moment are quite poor. There's need to diversify our livelihoods uh, the majority of the people depend obviously on agriculture and on the single crops, the maize or maybe the soy, but we need to diversify the crops that are grown as well as look at diversification of livelihoods. Last but not least, we need to maximize income that is generated from the agriculture sector. And one way of maximizing this is to promote value addition of agricultural products. At the moment, a number of farmers that are negatively uh, experiencing the impacts of climate change are getting very little even from the agriculture due to the prominence of crop failure. So one of the key things that will be required is to ensure that moving forward, there's a lot of value addition so that the income that is generated is, uh, uh, is more to support livelihoods. Now there is a cycle. We need to appreciate that with the reduction of income comes unsustainable agricultural practices as people try by all means to maximize uh, on what they want. So it is important that agricultural production uh, and the agriculture sector uh, benefits from uh, value addition, which at the moment is poor. And I must say that moving forward, the future of agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa is, will not just be in production, but to be about post-service handling and uh, value addition. With those words, thank you so much for listening.
Thank you so much, much, Felix, for your uh, very, very insightful presentation. Um, as, as you can see and um, hear, uh, things are very different in different countries. And it seems at the moment that there is an extra microphone on at the moment. Coming a little bit of background noise there. Okay. Yes. So uh, thank you, Felix, very much, much for your presentation and, and a viewpoint to, to how to adapt to climate change. Um, and uh, especially for us who are not uh, living in the southern part of Africa in, in, in those conditions, uh, it's interesting to see how different it is from, from the um, effects of climate change that we have here in, in Finland or in Europe or northern part of the world and so on. And uh, just a reminder about the Padlet for everybody that uh, you can post questions in, in Padlet and uh, Felix will be replying to the questions there. Thank you, Felix. Then, oh, then we have the next speaker um, in line talking from his own, own point of view about his own company. Uh, we have uh, Satoshi Miyajima, uh, he's a co-owner or, or the owner of the Miyajima Brewery Company, making um, uh, locally rooted sake in, uh, in, um, in Nagano. So please go ahead, Satoshi, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for your introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Satoshi Miyajima. I'm an, uh, the owner of locally rooted Japanese sake brewery, Miyajima Brewery Company. Our brand name is Shinano Nishiki. Shinano means Nagano Prefecture. Nishiki means the great nature. Our company was established in 1911. Then please listen to my presentation. Uh, rice cultivation with emphasis on soil cultivation. Not using chemicals on farmland as much as possible. 20th century farming developed with the use of many agrochemicals and synthetic fertilizers to increase productivity. However, it has not been fully discovered how the chemicals and the chemical residues that have flowed out are affecting the ecosystems of microorganisms and more. If we adapt uh, pesticide-free farming to control the usage of agrochemicals and synthetic fertilizers as much as possible, it can maintain a safe and secure water system and protect abundance diverse ecosystems of farmland and its surroundings. Leading to the control of greenhouse gases. Organic farming decomposes fertilizers more gradually comp compared to the case of using synthetic ones. Therefore, the active use of organic fertilizers can retain the fixed carbon in soil for a long time and gradually release dinitrogen monoxide, which has several hundred times more greenhouse effects than carbon dioxide. Also, restricting the usage of agricultures, chemicals, and synthetic fertilizers can maintain the diversity around farmland. It's known that carbon can be retained in many ways and that organisms fix carbon in their bodies. If we chemical substances are little as possible in agriculture land to maintain the biodiversity of the soil and its surroundings, such action becomes a concrete measure to climate change. Sake brewing using low polish rice. Stop over polishing rice. 
since the end of 20th century, a food crisis has been warned along with a vasting population. After entering the 21st century, the dry weather, abnormal growth of grasshoppers, and other situations due to climate change have brought about the food crisis. Going forward, sake brewing will struggle with a growing food demand in the raw material procurement stage. We are on the verge of a situation where we can't brew sake without first securing rice as food. As a result of the rice processing technology has been highly developed, a sense of value fixed a highly polished rice sake is the best. Sake that uses uses a lot of energy to polish rice and has high food wastage has become popular. It's time to try sake brewing used raw polished rice to appreciate earth blessing. However, we should keep in mind that tasty sake also can be made of low polished rice that is a similar polishing rate to that the regular grain of rice that we eat. The value of being Junmai Sake, not using brewing alcohol. Brewing alcohol is obtained by distillation after brewing the syrup that is what is left after taking sugar from sugar cane? In Japan, we add heat to the crude alcohol that was transported all the way from Brazil and other countries for continuous distillation, making it almost flavorless and tasteless. Brewing alcohol can make sake taste clean up and bring out the East aroma in Ginjo Sake. However, we always have to keep in mind that brewing alcohol is produced by creating a huge burden on the global environment. With global food shortage now, the price of brewing alcohol has already risen significantly. It is assumed that the price of brewing alcohol will jump more over when the carbon tax is introduced. But before that, I think many breweries should think over the environmental road and choose to make Junmai Sake without using brewing alcohol. Developing regional food culture. The flavor of Jumai sake, which is made by not adjusting the taste with brewing alcohol, change, changes largely depending on the year's climate. This is the best part about Japanese sake because you can taste the climate. And it is also the value of local sake that makes you feel the taste of the land. The experience of tasting Jumai sake evokes a sense of climate and can let a person resonate and deepen their understanding of the regional food culture, which contributes to the development of the regional culture and region. Locally rooted sake brewery. Local production for local consumption and self sufficiency. I believe brewers should be the ind indigenous sake brewery rooted in the land we live in. Sake that is rubbed by the locals. 
and it is not dependent on unified values such as industrial products. As a member of a local community, we can con continuously contribute by brewing sake using local produce and by enjoying the sake with the local foods made by the locals. I believe that the local production for local consumption and self-sufficiency that can circulate the regional economy as well as minimizing the transport energy by working together with local farmers is the basis of Brazilians that can sustain the region for the future. Our effort for label-free bottles, thinking for a social environmental load. Japanese sake is a symbol of Japanese food culture. Today, the labels are big and variously expressed as rag and artwork. However, such labels consume biomass resources and require plastic film for protection and takes a huge energy load in the cleansing process for reusing bottles. At present, the Shina no Nishiki bottles have actively used a label-free approach. It wraps a label around the shoulder of the bottle instead of the bottom. This type of label saves resources and can be peed off easily, which greatly reduces the load of cringing process for reuse. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Miyajima. It was very interesting to hear about sake and how it can be can be done also in a, in a sustainable way very interesting thank you thank you we will then move forward and uh, come to finland for for a bit um we have um one of our entrepreneurs here in north karelia anni korhonen uh, she's the hostess of a well-being guest house uh, and she's also a chef and she's also a musician playing kantele uh, and an organic farmer, and she will tell about uh, her her uh, company's uh, sustainability issues. And I will again share Anni's slides. Here we go. Great, great. And I'm very pleased uh, to speak to you about this very, very important issue and uh, and um, this uh, how we all can do something about climate change and how we can how we can adaption us to climate change. And please, I remember you all also that uh, there is this, that you are free to um, ask me anything in there in, a, um, in a other, other section. But I start with my, my um, show now. So I'm located in Finland, in North Europe, in Scandinavia. And in Finland, I located in east part of Finland. And now we see we have four seasons in, in, in Finland. And now we live in winter, in very, very deep winter. We have now, now about 50 centimeters snow on the ground and a probably mostly like a minus 10 decrease 
a few words about me, who I am. So Gaia already said that I, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a, a cantele player. So it means that I play this Finnish national instrument called cantele. Then uh, I am an I am very deep in with uh, Finnish food culture. So I'm a food ambassador in our area. And I'm very, uh, I'm very keen on uh, Finnish and uh, Karelian and East part of Finnish food culture. And that is what I do the most in my guest house that I, I do and give the people the most best and unique experience with, with food. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, our guest house, few words, our guest house, uh, before I go deep with the adoption in, in, in travel industry. Um, so we are a family run business um, founded in uh, 1991 by my parents, Anita and Heikki. And I bought the farm, forest and this guest house from my parents uh, 2012. So I have running now the business over 10 years. Uh, uh, my background is that I am I'm studying in 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 Savonia in uh, in uh, and my my uh, I, I was studying about the uh, restaurant management and then I've been working as a restaurant manager in very very. Uh, many places and so and then I came back here uh, like uh, 13 years ago but I have been working uh, around the world and around uh, Finland uh, and for me why I I came back here to run the family family business it's my values they are be follow me since I left home and I realized that uh, without this this um, very very uh, like a value-based life I, I don't feel myself as me so I, I needed to quit my my very good job uh, in in Goli because I, I felt myself that I don't follow my values. But now when I'm I'm doing this uh, here in Finland with my guest house, I can be, um, I am sure that I can uh, follow my values. I can share my values to our guests. And that has always have been very important to me that I can explain to our guests that, uh, how how I do things and how the what are my values and why I want to do this. Saving uh, saving the world is our or for all of us. It is the most important thing. And how I wanna how I how how I can save the world is that I can serve the food. Uh, which is organic farmed. I can serve the food which is foraging from the forest. I can serve the food which is very um, it's uh, that it's based on our own culture. So it's three very minutes. Important. Sorry, three minutes left. Three minutes. Three okay, minutes left. Then next slide. Then uh, to the subject, uh, how we can adoption here nowadays, uh, our our climate change effects. And I need to say that where we see the most 
the climate change is our winter. It's going to be shorter and it's going to be less snow and so on. So now what we have already done is that we have reduced uh, the skiing programs and we are getting, we are offering for our visitors different kind of uh, doing with the snow. So it 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 is only with the skiing. It's all also that we are uh, giving the people uh, a possibility to uh, doing uh, something else also in the nature with the snow. And uh, what is the very important thing, well, because we are still here in the purest country in the world, that we are starting thinking, uh, uh, renegative thinking. That is the most important thing to us that we, we can, we can uh, have also this pureness and beautiness uh, for the next generations. And I also, um, I also want to um, tell our visitors that how they can be involved doing things, that we don't just entrepreneurs don't make the things for, for the uh, environmental things, that also the tourists will do the things. And... Um, there is very uh, two things for me which are very important now that I can do do uh, um, very very good things for for em, em, environmental issues and also sustainable that we have this uh, program for all the tourist sector which is uh, run by Visit Finland so we have this sustainable from a Finland uh, program. And it is very good for all our entrepreneurs. And also, I have one of the signature in classroom declaration. So they are very good actions through it. But for me and the other entrepreneurs who are, for example, uh, sig um, making the signature in this classroom uh, declaration that that we also wanted that people, our tourists, our guests are doing things when they are travel, that they are doing the things that they are sustainable. And for me, it's always been very important that when we do the sustainable, sustainable tourism, that we are, we are very honest with ourselves we are ourselves and we we do we don't we don't do any things that are not good for us to so mm, i'm very keen on to hear you uh what are you thinking about tourism and flying and how you are going to do your, for example, holidays in the future and what you are thinking about, uh, what you are want to do and feel and see when you travel to other countries and other cultures. Uh, you can show the last. Uh, and please contact me also through social media. I'm very please, if you contact me, for example, in LinkedIn or in Instagram, and special, uh, our Instagram is in English, so you will understand something, but don't hesitate also join us our Facebook, um, because there is some Finnish, but there's never be late to learn some Finnish. So thank you for all. And I, I will, I will uh, very keen on to see your questions. Bye. Thank you, Anni, very much for your presentation about how you are dealing with sustainability in, in your own company. And uh, like it's a, it's a matter of culture and also something that is uh, inside of you. So thank you very much.
We will move forward now then to another part of the world, or actually two parts of the world. Uh, our next um, presentation is from uh, Marianela Pepe. She's from Argentina and from uh, a joint presentation with uh, Brigitte Gunawan. She's from Indonesia. So we have from two different countries a joint presentation. Uh, unfortunately, they are not able to participate, um, but we will show their uh, presentation. And uh, they are both members of the Earth Echo Youth Leadership Council. And I will first start the presentation here in the background. And then I will share my screen. Hi, my name is Marianela Pepe. I am from Argentina. I am part of Earth Echoes YLC with uh, Brigitte Bunawan. The YLC, or Earth Echoes Youth Leadership Council, is a team of young environmental leaders who play a key role leading Earth Echoes education programs while developing and implementing campaigns to mobilize young people worldwide to protect our ocean planet. In this case, I'm going to talk about my own country, Argentina, um, and I'm going to talk about tourism in Argentina. So Argentina is a huge country. Its extension goes across many different ecosystems. So we could say that climate change affects the country as a whole in many different ways. Um, some parts are getting drier, while the north, in the, like the north, while floods are getting more common in the Mesopotamia area. Extreme weather conditions, and coastal erosion, and desertification in the Patagonia, etc. We're currently on summer holidays, so one of the greatest topics among Argentinians today is where are they going on vacation? Historically, most popular cities have been Buenos Aires, Cordoba, Rosario, where people try to escape from, from, the, from their routines and extreme heat conditions produced by the heat island phenomena. In their places to nearby cities like Mar del Plata, Gualeguaychú, Miramar de Senusa, etc. All of these places surrounded by big bodies of water such as the ocean or the Parana River. So quite after um, internet and social media exploded, people from the Patagonia started noticing that their places were receiving more and more people who decided to start spending their summer holidays in the northern Patagonia, as there, there were extreme heat waves all, uh, were also becoming an issue during this summer in, in the Atlantic coast. So Hotels started getting fuller, and of course, um, things start happening. Uh, many tourists aren't aware of how to take care of these places, and it's it's a hard work letting tourists know that what they're doing might be good or might be catastrophically wrong for the area. So, as forest fires started increasing due to tourists not knowing how to how and where to make fire, signalization increased as well about uh, fire risk, about how to make a good fire, and also we started teaching people, not only tourists, but also locals, how to take care of their own environment, and also um, spreading the news with social media outreach about how to take care of the places where you go on vacation. And now I'm going to leave you with Brigida, who's going to talk about Indonesia. Hi everyone, my name is Brigida. I come from Indonesia, which is colored in red in this map. So as we know, climate change is affecting the globe in so many different ways. And in context for Indonesia, surface temperatures are increasing per decade about 0.2 to 0.3 degrees Celsius. And patterns are changing where there are different parts of the country experiencing hotter weather and also wetter seasons. And this also affects the risks of floods and droughts in different parts of the country. It impacts the biodiversity, for example, declines in fish larvae. There is also coral bleaching, habitat loss, and it is also impacting human health. And there are also more frequent forest fires if there are more droughts. And of course, stronger El Nino and La Nina events, which are affecting the food production and also hunger. So what have I been seeing as an ocean advocate 
to adapt to climate change? Well, I can speak from my own experiences where I have also spoken at the United Nations Ocean Conference about ocean climate solutions. So as a background, I have launched 30 by 30 Indonesia, which is a movement to protect at least 30% of the global ocean by 2030. And it is a global goal, which also aims to protect 30% of the global land as well. And this specifically is a project that focuses on education, policy advocacy, and habitat restoration. So from my own experiences, 30 by 30 Indonesia has garnered this attention of Bali's provincial government and also reached over 400 pictures of support last year. And these are only some of the pictures from both youth and adults alike. And as you can see, these uh, focus on outreach efforts by the community. And what can we take from this? Well, it is important to note that climate adaptation is a community effort as well. We can do so many things. We can start right here, right now, from wherever we are. And these are just two examples right here. So I launched uh, two events back in 2022. One was a celebration for Earth Day, which was to plant three reef structures on uh, the ocean floor in Bali which is called the 30 by 30 Coral Garden. Whereas we also planted 200 mangroves in Jakarta. And I led a group of high school students to do this on the coast of Jakarta. Education itself is really important because we know climate uh, adaptation starts at its core from education. And these are some pictures of policy advocacy. They're actually um, from the Bali's provincial government website, as they have supported the movement of 30 by 30. And here are also some more pictures of restoration projects. And as you can see, there are lots of different ages that are joining from diverse backgrounds, and they're all committed and have come together to take action for climate adaptation. And this specifically focuses on ocean climate, nature-based solutions. So now we want you to take part as well. And maybe you're wondering, how can I start my journey? Well, we have the solution for you. Marianella and I are personally inviting you to join Gen Z. All you have to do is head to joingenc.org. It is a global platform where you can share your passion for networking, learning, and take collective action together as a community from wherever you are around the globe. So you can build your profile and create connections and also amplify your impact. So we invite you to just watch this quick video and we'll see you on Gen C. We are Gen C. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation today and we really hope you have learned something from this presentation and session and we will see you again in Gen C. Thank you so much. Okay, a virtual thank you to, to Marianela and to Brigitta. A very nice presentation and a very good call for action also for all of you to participate in. And I especially liked, liked the fact that there were um, also mentioned about how the community needs to be taken, uh, taken in, in the climate actions and how, how um, the community is also important. So not only individual people, but also communities as well as governments and international organizations, of course, but, but uh, taking the community perspective is, is also very important. We will then move forward again with our program. And um, like you have maybe noticed, we have had some technical difficulties today uh, with the presentations and, and um, it has been um, difficult for, for some, some to share their presentations. And also with the next presentation, um, we were um, 
we were uh, having uh, Leonardo David Hidalgo Ortega from Peru. Um, I will uh, present him, but unfortunately the video wouldn't play for us uh, when we were uh, testing it. So uh, we will upload his video to YouTube, uh, NO YouTube um, uh, today. And also in NO YouTube, you can find some additional videos from yesterday as well, which were not shown during the, during the um, conference itself. But uh, Leonardo is a, is a high school student from um, uh, uh, Agustin de Hipona in, in uh, Peru, and he has um, represented his school in different competitions in maths and in science, scientific fairs. And um, he has been uh, working together with one of his teachers, uh, Liliana Valencia, for his presentation. But like I said, unfortunately, uh, we are not able to uh, show the presentation because um, it, it wouldn't start playing. We tested all these presentations but earlier and we tested all of the PowerPoint presentations. Sometimes they work and unfortunately, sometimes they don't work. But uh, we will uh, upload um, Leonardo's uh, presentation to, to YouTube so you can watch it from there uh, starting, uh, starting this evening or so. And our apologies also to Leonardo for, for this. Um, the next one is um, Leo from, uh, from Kenya. And um, let me just check. Are you here, Leo? Yes, hello, Leo. So I will first present Leo and then uh, Leo will present his, um, his case. And um, Leo is from Kenya and he's studying, studying there uh, in the vocational school, Kisumu National uh, Polytechnic school uh, in, in the environmental program um, and also part of the uh, institution's environmental club. And um, they, they have a clean marketplace and they also plant trees uh, within, uh, within that uh, club. And uh, I will now share your presentation in one moment. and share screen. Can you see the presentation? Yeah, I'm unable to see it. Okay, all right. Just tell me when to uh, switch to the next slide. And if we experience some very severe uh, network uh, uh, problems, uh, we can stop the presentation and we can also upload a recorded presentation from you to the YouTube. But uh, please uh, go ahead, you can start okay. your presentation. Once again, I would like to thank you, uh, Miss, for giving me this chance to talk to the world and letting them know that Kenya is also one of the nations that is also um, fighting against uh, zero carbon emission is fighting against uh, the climate change. Uh, uh, as you know, I come from Kenya, which is known, for, which is the pride of Africa, and we are known in uh, sports like rugby, tourism, and uh, marathon. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the climate change adaptation for net zero carbon emission. And I'm just going to talk about a little bit. Next page. So, climate change uh, is one of the biggest complex development challenges of our time, where we uh, we are facing different issues, and uh, these different issues we are facing. Uh, in terms of controlling it and in terms of how it is affecting the environment. Its impact, as you already know, is already visible. And the scientific scientific evidence shows the problem is lessening fast and it's already stretch, stretching the ability of human and natural system to adapt. In Kenya, most sensitive sectors of the economy, such as agriculture, in which it accounts the the highest GDP of our nation, and we have forestry, energy production, health, internal security, 
are threatened by climate change, according to studies by the National Environmental Management Authority, an organization based in Kenya. I'm going to talk about how climate change is dealing with today and how it will have a direct bearing on human development prospects in the future. Next page, please. Before I continue, we have to understand the term adaptation. And we know the term adaptation encompasses a broad range of responses that help governments, communities, and individuals cope with the impact of climate change. And how can we respond to the climate change? It requires two, it requires action on two fronts. Number one, we have adaptation to the consequences of current and future climate change. And the second is mitigation of climate change by drastically reducing global greenhouse gas emission and avoiding future emissions in development in developing countries and ensuring carbon sink like the rainforest, rainforest are preserved. Adaptation can be the adjustment in economic, social, or natural system in response to actual or expected climate change to limit harmful consequences and exploit beneficial opportunities. Next page, please. Then how can we adapt to the climate change? Working through an adaptation process will be different from co communities, business and public sectors organization. However, there's a generic adaptation process along with a number of tools and resources to support each sector. Uh, the adaptation process may consist of five stages to help get started with adaptation, understand, access the impacts of current and future climate change, identify and prioritize the adaptation option to address key climate risk, help in implement adaptation actions, evaluate and continuously monitor and review the work. With these five steps, I'm sure uh, the adaptation process can be able to be managed and can be able to work through so as to enhance zero carbon emissions. Next page, please. You have three minutes left. Next page, please. And number one, we started with getting started, in which we have the process, finding about the impacts of climate change, understanding why the impacts of climate change matter, raising awareness and tackling next steps. Next page, please. The second step we had understand the impacts of climate change. And the process in this stage includes learning about past climate trends and future projection, understanding how your place, assets, services, or priorities have been affected by severe weather events in the past, and uh, considering how your place, assets, services, or priorities might be affected as our climate continues to change. Next page, please. Now, the third step was identify and prioritize action which includes establishing a vision for climate ready future, identify the most significant climate risk and identifying existing adaptation option. And the last is examining what further action is needed. Next page, please. The fourth action is to take action. And the state process includes partnership working with a leadership collecting and presenting your adaptation action, building adaptive capacity, implementing on the ground action and telling others, telling them the information about the, uh, the, adapt, the policy. Next page, please. The fifth step, which is the last step was monitor, review and evaluate. And the process includes monitoring and reporting progress, reviewing regularly, reflecting on what has worked and why. Then the last is evaluating the outcomes and the, uh, the, possi the possible impacts from the project or the policy. 
next page please climate change action plan through so the national environmental management authority uh there is the first change action plan is emission reduction in which we have renewable energy and efficiency which we have to implement the use of renewable energy and through trans transportation which we have to control the uh, emission of carbon by the introduction of uh, electric cars and through waste management is through uh, proper waste management uh, proper, the proper disposal and proper ways of handling waste through industrial sources is how the industries can uh, manage their waste, how the industry can uh, control the uh, emission of uh, carbon in the environment. And we have uh, all other emission reductions. Next page, please. Adaptation to climate change. The adaptation already impacting communities and commerce, seasonal, seasonal uncertainties, water concern, habitat and ecosystem changes, health and public safety, resource industry sectors impacted. The do thing approach will result in, will result in greater cost, vulnerability and risk, which will be risk assessment to identify vulnerabilities and priority actions climate proof development decision, strengthen measures to protect coastal areas, adaptive management of national resources. Next page, please. And uh, I will give you one minute. Through the action plan, we have community engagement where we, uh, we have to uh, promote education. We share the responsibilities, and also supporting the development communities based on engagement and also encouraging beneficial individual action. Next page, please. Conclusion, scientific evidence on climate change and its impact is conclusive. Climate change is concentration problem as we as well as an emission problem and both mitigation and adaptation is needed in an effective. And to conclude this, we have to introduce the three R, the three, the use of three R's, which is reduce, reuse, recycle, and reabsorb. Next question, next page, please. Uh, I think my presentation comes to an end. And once more, thank you for uh, allowing me to participate in the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Yes, very, very good insights. And again, a call to action. So there is things that each of us can, can do to fight climate change and, and to adapt to it. Thank you very much, Leo. Then next in the program, we have um, we have a student from, from Japan. We have uh, Ryusuke Inouchi, and he's studying at the Faculty of Textile Science and Technology at Shinshu University in the Nagano Prefecture. So um, please go ahead. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, it's in, in it is in presentation mode now. Yes. Okay. Thank you for your thank you for your interaction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Ryosuke Inochi. I'm a student at Faculty of Texture Science and Technology, Shinshu University. That presentation, uh, today's presentation is titled "Local Industry and Climate Change in Weather." Today, I will present the following. First, where is Weda? Weda is a city in eastern central Nagano prefecture. This is Weda Castle, a symbol of Weda. Weda is located at an altitude of 450 meters above sea level and is a basin. So Weda has significant difference 
in temperature between day and night, summer and winter. In addition, weather has, weather has many sunny days and second lowest precipitation in Japan. But see the graph on the right. It is annual average temperature for the last 40 years in weather. As you can see, in recent years, temperatures in weather have been risen. So I think that various local industries may be affected by this temperature rise. Several members of my faculty at Shinshu University decided to investigate the effect of climate change on local industries. These four are uh, subject of the investigation. I was responsible for traditional crafts. From here, I briefly described the result of my members' investigation. The first is the result of the investigation of sake. Sake is Japanese rice wine. We interviewed the two breweries as a, res as a result. They both said that the amount of investment in refrigeration equipment to cool the lights and the electricity bill are increasing. Next, result of investigation of crops cultivation. Apple and grape are representative crops of weather. So we interviewed apple orchards and vineyard. As a result, they said the number of cases of heat-related illness and natural disasters is increasing. So we are taking measures to change the stronger varieties. Next, result of investigation of festival. Japanese people love cherry blossoms and held cherry blossom during party in spring. In weather, many tourists visit weather castle for the cherry blossom festival. So we interviewed the weather city office, which manages the festival. As a result, he said the timing of cherry blossom blooming is fluctuating. This may affect the period of the festival and the number of visitors. From here, I describe the result of my investigations. Weather has long been famous for its sericultural industry. Today, the silk fabric called weather tsumugi, designated as a traditional craft, I interviewed Koibai Tsumugi Workshop. Koibai Tsumugi Workshop does dyeing, warping, waving, and making into products such as the wallet. One of the features of the workshop is that it offers products dyeing with weather specialties, such as discard bags of apples. It produces uniquely gentle colors. This is dyed with apple bags. As a result of the interview, the good point is that water pipes don't freeze in the winter due to the temperature rise. But the bad point is that dyeing solution is difficult to cook. In this workshop, they adapt by changing the time allocation of the work. In addition, an interesting initiative was contributing to the SDGs, SDGs through local industry. In summary, the results are, are as follows. In conclusion, we found that various local industries at weather are affected by climate change. Some parts are adapting, but burdens seems to be too much. The common burden is the cost of electricity. Higher outside temperatures make it difficult for something to cool. And then increased use of cooling equipment and much electricity consumption to cool them. 
Finally, a lot of electricity will, will be needed. But I think it is also an opportunity to convert energy to clean energy. Do you remember the just characteristics of weather's climate? Weather has many sunny days and second lowest precipitation in Japan. So weather is very suitable for solar power generation. It is expected that the extra electricity needed can be generated by solar power. And then it can be both mitigation and adaptation. Thank you for listening. Please come to weather and experience local industries. If you contact me, you send a message at this email address. Thank you. Thank you, Ruska, very much for your interesting presentation with lots of different things that, um, that can be done, done to adapt to climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next uh, presenter is also from Japan, uh, Ryota Yokoyama from the Totori University of Environmental Studies. Uh, so please, Ryota, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, thank you for introducing me. Okay, oh, can I hear me? Is that okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm giving a presentation titled Enter Environmental Education for Reconnecting Relationships Between Human and the Environment in Agriculture. I'm honored to join this conference today, but I have only six minutes for my presentation. So unfortunately, I don't have to, time to describe all slides. So uh, please watch my presentation on YouTube later, or I'm, I'm happy to answer uh, if you have any questions on podcasts later. So let's get started. Um, next slide, please. First, I'm a Ryota Koyama, a university student majoring in environmental studies. My study is about uh, environmental education and agriculture. Uh, next slide, please. Um, today's table is here. And uh, next slide, please. Introduction. Uh, because of climate change and more and more pe places will suffer from droughts, flooding, etc. Um, also, the world population explosion will be a big burden on the environment. Then uh, it is likely that traditional agriculture is no longer working and also uh, hunger risk is rising. As a result, a uh, food war uh, could erupt and the food security will be at the brink. Uh, next slide, please. So when looking at the agricultural condition in Japan, uh, actually there are a lot of challenges like uh, shortage taxes, uh, like decreasing birth rate and aging society, etc. Also, food self-sufficiency rate was only 38% in 2021. In short, agriculture in Japan is at the brink. Uh, next slide, please. So as a result, because of the decline of agriculture, uh, we will lose beauty of landscape, biodiversity, and marriage functions like diving for water, water resources. Uh, also, the also, the problem of food insecurity is becoming more and more serious. Next slide, please. So then we need to protect domestic, domestic or local agriculture by promoting local produ production for local consumption. In other words, uh, we need to protect agriculture in communities and uh, make consensus agreements. Uh, but how? How to incentivize people in communities? In my hypothesis, uh, education has the power. Also, sustainable tourism has the same power as well. Uh, has the power as well. The power will change the society. Next slide, please. I am giving a presentation uh, based on press study that I conducted in Kamikaze, Tokushima, Tokushima uh, last summer. So next slide, please. The town is famous for zero waste, which long since, to, since two, 2002. I'm speaking about the zero waste project. Our residents must separate waste into 45 types by themselves. I wonder uh, it is possible by residents uh, voluntarily uh, if they have consensus agreement on this project, what roles education play? So ways of my uh, ways of my research are semi semi structure interviews to local people, and also at the, at the school in the town, and examining all. I'm um, I'm skipping some slides until my study and perspective from from here. Uh, sorry about that. So next up, next slide, please. 
Um, this slide is, is about the Kamikaze Elementary School and Junior High School. Um, next slide, please. Also, uh, this slide is about the tourism in Kamikaze. Next slide, please. And the result of interviews. And next slide, please. And the examination. And next slide, please. Same, same examination. Um, next slide, please. So from here, uh, here comes my study and perspective. Uh, local environment education, uh, LLE, which is environment education, uh, mixed local education, have a power to change the society. The education, nurture, uh, civic pride, and the sense of the environment. Also, it creates a repair effect or a spread sense of value in uh, eco-friendly lifestyle. Uh, for example, a uh, center of circle uh, colored green, like uh, children uh, change their mindset, the, then people like parents are uh, uh, change their mindset as as well, and gradually the repair effect develops to the community, and be power of changing the society. Uh, more people have interest in agriculture or the environment. Next slide, please. So in my theory, a uh, process of developing consensus agreement and the local uh, can be explained in a uh, uh, theory of a dialectic. A uh, local people from outside, uh, like tourists. Uh, inter interact with each other and creates um, new perspectives. And keep on, keep on, um, this activity leads to consensus agreements and, or local development. Also, if, if some tourists get fascinated in communities uh, through tourism or the education, uh, more people move to local area from city. In this way, local can tackle local decline and also a uh, decline of agriculture. Uh, that, that is hopeful in my opinion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, when showing my study by triangle, uh, here it is. Um, I study with focusing on relationships with subject and objects. To make outcome, um, I focus on tools, communities, or also um, in this triangle. So next slide, please. So uh, in my study, outcomes are to, uh, is to reconnect our relationship with the environment and agriculture between a uh, human and, uh, sorry, um, and between environment and agriculture, also human, by using LEE, LEE uh, local environment education. Um, next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, using local environment education as a tool to change the society norm. Uh, students and tourists uh, learn agriculture and get interested um, through uh, local, local environment education, like uh, agriculture experience. Uh, this education nurtures civic pride and also incentivizes people to protect the environment and agriculture in Japan, especially in the com in communities. So the education that creates consensus agreements and the report effects and gradually uh, change the society in the long run. So I'm studying and examining the effect uh, by action research from now on. Uh, the purpose, yeah. Uh, the purpose of my study is to make communities or region better or management better. Next slide, please. Here's a reference. So thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, I will answer them later on further. Thank you very much. Thank you, you Ryota, very much for, for your presentation. Very important issues, issues included there as well. I think we will go straight to the last presenter, so we can almost be be on time. Um, uh, our last uh, presenter is Morgan uh, Janowicz. She's a board member partnership coordinator at Green Rev Institute and the coordinator of Future Fo Food for Climate Coalition. So go ahead, Morgan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for for the opportunity to be today with you. My name is Morgan Janovic. I'm a partnership coordinator of Green Ref Institute, uh, the initiator of the Future Food for Climate Coalition. Green Ref Institute is a think tank based in Poland that works towards a sustainable food system transition. We are the members of seven international coalitions. We are also accredited next to the UNEP. Uh, I will present to you the topic about sustainable food system, which is the legislation for the broken food system. Green Rath Institute connects the dots between uh, uh, climate, biodiversity, human and animal rights. We base our activities on the partnership and cooperation, uh, systemic activities and the involvement of youth. 
Green Wrath Institute initiated uh, the Future Food for Climate Coalition that consists of 76 organizations from Poland and Ukraine. It is the very first coalition in Poland that works towards a sustainable food system. Um, sustainable food system law is is the initiative that was presented by the European Commission in the third quarter of this year, of 2023. Um, sustainable food system law includes the following pillars. Sustainable food procurements, food waste, and sustainable labeling. The development of the sustainable food system law included a public uh, consultation conducted by the European Commission, which took place last year in July 2022. As Green Ref Institute and Future Food for Climate, we have uh, mobilized and engaged experts, activists, and civil society organizations in the consultation that will have a direct impact on the shape of the final document. And afterwards, in September 2022, there was another opportunity to share the opinion about what should be included in the sustainable food system um, law. But the question is, why do we need sustainable food system law? Well, the answer is because the current system is the source of the climate crisis, biodiversity loss, health crisis, among others. Animal agriculture is the source of 14.5% of the global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. If we switch to a vegetarian or vegan diet at the EU level, then greenhouse gas emissions would decrease by up to 70%. We also need to shift the responsibility from the uh, consumer side to the, to the decision-making and local government side. So currently the topic of the food system transition is being highly omitted in the public debate. However, we will not be able uh, to counter today's as well as future challenges without the food system uh, change. The European Commission in its recent working document on food security pointed out that uh, food environment are shaped by policymakers and business mainly. Animal agriculture sector is responsible for 78% of biodiversity loss on land in Europe. At the same time, looking at the broken system, we see that 3.1 billion people worldwide don't have access to the healthy and nutritious food. The adaptation of the certain measures within the farm to fork strategy and sustainable food system law gives us the opportunity to shift away from the non-sustainable polluting animal agriculture towards plant-based. And compared to previous years, there has never been more attention around the food system at the EU level than today. But of course, we have to keep in our minds, we have to be aware that business as usual will be present, certainly much more before the elections in the European Union in the next year. So in March last year, 2022, the link between animal welfare, environment, and sustainable development has been noticed by United Nations Environment Assembly, when during the fifth session of the United Nations Environmental Environment Assembly in Nairobi, the Nexus resolution was uh, adopted. And it is significant in the way that it recognizes the link between animal welfare, uh, environment, and sustainable development, and points out the need for a holistic approach. As Green Rest Institute, we strongly believe that there is no future without the youth, and there is no debate without our involvement, participation, and implementation of changes. And this is why I wanted to present to you the Pilotage Project, Green Advocacy Academy, that is an example of how we can progress and bring the real change. So the project is co-founded by the European Union. The project brings together the youth aged 14, 24 from Finland and Poland. It consists of seven workshops and study visit to the European Parliament and the participation in the debate with the members of the European Parliament. So during those uh, workshops, more than 30 young people are being introduced to the importance of advocacy activities, of European Green Deal, including farm to fork strategy and sustainable food system framework. 
together with uh, inspiring experts, activists, and representatives of uh, organizations, we show a critical view on the current food system. To sum up, Green Rats Institute and Future Food for Climate are engaging all actors in the debate about food system transition through open letters, calls to action, roundtables, debates, expert panels, closed meetings, constantly engaging with new initiatives and organizations through partnership, cooperation, and, uh, and inclusion. We're also reaching out uh, through involvement in mainstream events and publications full of data, experts uh, that are open for everyone and everything to raise awareness and to bring the topic of food system transition to the public debate. We have to be aware that, uh, of the fact that meat, dairy and egg sector are polluters and uh, the source of today's and future crisis. The sustainable food system is plant-based. Thank you very much. Thank you, Morgan, very much for your punctual presentation uh, and very interesting presentation also. We had some, some discussions about food also yesterday and in the, uh, in the um, YouTube channel also from yesterday. And this kind of like contributes and, and continues from that. So thank you very much. Uh, that is all the presentations uh, that we have. And um, next I will invite my colleague from Karelia University of Applied Sciences Lasse Okkonen, uh, who's a principal lecturer there in uh, energy and environmental engineering to provide us a short uh, wrap up of what has been discussed today. So welcome Lasse and the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Kaya. And thank you everyone for really interesting presentations. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, wrap up and, and summarize some, some points from these this presentations. So as, as we have heard, uh, there needs to be uh, quite an extensive and, and, and broad educational knowledge on, on climate change and its and, and on understanding its impacts in different uh, different regions and in different types of systems. These presentations on, on, on the, from the perspectives of agriculture, food production, local tourism, also uh, food, food industry, crafting industry, textile industry. They all um, gave us an idea on, on how climate change is affecting uh, people, communities and, and businesses. And, and, and referring to uh, Leo Kompare's uh, presentation on, on how this is a complex phenomena and we need to have an um, strategy to adapt that there was a really valuable valuable um, lessons on, on how this can be done in different steps. There needs to be adjustment practices, limiting of, of harmful impacts, and also capturing of uh, opportunities that, that can be found from the adaptation. On the other hand, we need to have uh, strategies on, on, uh, on really locally tailored manner and, and also earning learning systems like were mentioned in, in Professor Kalabas uh, presentation. These uh, phenomena are quite complex and there needs to be understanding on, on system interdependencies and, and how, how these uh, systems are interrelated to each, each other. I think that uh, presentation from, from, um, from, from um, Africa and, and, and how the uh, temperature pests and, and impacts on the livestock and uh, all the way to the human economy and, and, uh, and the household's food sec security, how they are interdependent. So there needs to be also a systematic uh, solutions. And I was really uh, happy to hear uh, different uh, strategies and, and solutions for the uh, adaptation. The restoration practices in in uh, nature ecosystems and and agroecology systems, uh, organic farming systems, and also uh, habitat restoration in in ocean environments, they are all really interesting and and novel, novel practices. So we can utilize and use the ecosystem's capacity to restore restore and renew activities and and operate in a climate smart manner. 
even if it's a Finnish forestry or, or an agriculture in in uh, in road areas or in uh, in uh, different types of uh, in environments. So youths are in uh, youth is in in key role in in advocacy work as uh, as uh, uh, Marianella Pepe and Brigitte Kandavan uh, presented. This advocacy work is an essential part. And I was happy to hear also about the Green Advocacy Academy that is then connected to the more generic uh, uh, European policy processes. Uh, in uh, adaptation, we need to have uh, regenerative business models. And there were several examples of, of how businesses can be regenerated. There can be uh, diversified livelihoods and value added to agricultural products to make them locally sustainable products. Or in sake industry, utilizing the local culture, tradition, and sustainable practices that are based on the natural and cultural heritage. So we can look back also and utilize different uh, uh, valuable uh, cultural heritages and, and practices to find adaptation strategies. And also connect the development to the sustainable development goals to, to, to consider the impact in, in a broader and, and in a comprehensive manner. The regenerative practices in local tourism are really uh, important. And they also provide a visitors opportunity to uh, experience the local culture and heritage and also create their own positive impact. So as the regenerative idea is to leave things better behind, that can be practiced in, in several sectors. Tourism can, tourists can provide valuable insights to local, local uh, communities. And they can also attend in the local environmental education and, and dialogue, like uh, mentioned in Ryota Yokohama's presentation. These uh, regenerative practices, they are also related to the economy. So this kind of new climate economy ideas and how businesses are affected by climate change and its, its costs, they were presented, uh, for instance, by Ryosuke Inuchi. In, in the cases of traditional crafts and silk fabrics and, and several, several sectors. So this, uh, this requires uh, businesses to consider the models that are, that are then uh, applicable to changing circumstances. Altogether, I would say that uh, this uh, session brought uh, really um, broad perspective and, and really comprehensive perspective on, on the topic of adaptation to climate change. How it's about education and understanding, how it's about finding strategies for adaptation, how it's about solutions for restoration and regeneration, how it's about advocacy and collaboration together to make the change. So thank you for all these presentations, and I hope that there is a really active discussion from these different perspectives in, in the Padlet, so that uh, perhaps you can share and, and learn together and perhaps exchange practices that, that, that are then valuable in different parts of the, the different parts of the globe. So thank you, Kaya, for providing me this opportunity to comment and wrap up. It was my pleasure, and I learned a lot this this uh, morning here in Finland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lasse. Uh, very very nice nice wrap up and uh, a conclusion, kind of like pulling it all together to make it uh, a more concrete, a more uh, cohesive um, topic for for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then it is time for our closing remarks. Uh, the closing remarks marks will be given by uh, Kazuhiro Fujimura, who is the ambassador of Japan to Finland. So please, uh, Mr. Fujimura, the floor is yours.
こんばんは、えー、長野の皆さん。ヒューバーパイバー、カレーリア、エンドオールフィンランド、ヘローエブリワン、アクロスワールド、聞こえますか大丈夫ですか ?I am Fujimura Kazuhiro, Ambassador of Japan to Finland. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. On the occasion of the closing of the International Zero Carbon Conference 2023, I would like to、uh, say a few words. First of all, I would like to pay tribute to Nagano Prefecture Government, Kaleria University of Applied Science, Sciences, University of Eastern Finland, and、uh, ENO Schoolnet、uh, Association. For your great efforts in organizing this conference. And I wish to express my appreciation to all for your insightful keynote speeches and presentations at the conference. Today,、uh, climate change and environmental issues are one of the most serious challenges. Facing us in the world. Mitigation and adaptation, the key words set out for each day of the conference, are sine qua non conditions for us to address these clear and present dangers to the flora and the fauna on the planet and to the humanity. I believe that all the participants. Have gained a lot of takeaways from these two day e v e n t In addition, through these crash course meetings, I feel convinced that the aim of this conference to connect people from Nagano Prefecture and North Karelia, Republic of Finland, and from all over the world. To learn together about climate change and environmental issues facing humanity, to consider solutions together and to trigger action has been successfully achieved. So let me say to you all, congratulations. I conclude my、uh, address by expressing my sincere hope that the participants of this、uh, International Zero Carbon Conference 2023 will make, uh, uh, will,、uh, make full use of the outcomes of this event and carry the torch as a leaders towards zero carbon. Down the road, and that Japan and Finland make differences in the world. どうもありがとうございました。キートクシアパーリアン、Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Fujimura, for your kind words.、Um, I especially liked you say,、uh, referring to, to the conference as a crash course. I will definitely start using that because that is short introductions to some issues.、Uh, crash course is a very good term to use. Thank you very much.、Um, before we close the whole conference,、uh, I have a few things、uh, that I would like to remind you about and to,、uh, to say to all of you、uh, in the audience. And also, also in,、um, uh, for the speakers. But、uh, first, I will、uh, address the, all, all of the audience、uh, about the Padlet. I will remind you about that. And then also,、uh, we have another、um, issue as well. So here is the Padlet again for,、um, for today.、Uh, you are free to keep commenting,、uh, asking questions, and so on. And then also, Um, we have another Padlet for you. The link will be posted to you.、Um, we are 
planning to have uh, meetups with uh, everybody who is interested in this topic, whether they have been presenters in this e event or whether they are students uh, who are listening or anybody who is interested in, in climate acti activities and so on. Uh, we have a Padlet for it already where you can uh, put your ideas in and uh, we will have a meetup on March the 22nd. It's a Wednesday. It's at 10 o'clock Finnish time, 9 p.m. Japanese time. And then according to your uh, time zone, of course, uh, changing changing um, or depending on that. And then the other one uh, will be in April, just before the Earth Day. So Earth Day is April 22nd. So on April 21st, Friday, we will have another another meet up and don't be alarmed that there's a 10 o'clock fin Finland and 11 o'clock Finland and this, it's five o'clock in Japan we change to the summertime uh, between March and April so that's why there is a one hour uh, bigger difference with the Japanese time but all of you are uh, welcome to to join these um, maybe we will start calling them crash courses uh, the idea is that we would have short, short introductions from different um, uh, students, from different uh, experts, uh, professionals who are already working in the field of uh, climate, climate change and climate activi uh, activities uh, to give short presentations about what they are doing in their own countries. So everybody is welcome to join to join in this, uh, this Padlet and these meetings. We will send information about this next week at the same time that we will publish the presentations with subtitles uh, on ENOS YouTube channel. So you will be receiving email from us uh, with more details next week. Then we had another thing that we wanted to do. Um, we have, after we finish here, we will have a five minute break. And if anybody is interested in staying back in the Zoom to discuss with us, um, most of the presenters will be also available uh, in that session, uh, discuss more freely. Uh, you are welcome to stay back uh, in Zoom for the five minute break, and then you can be um, promoted to panelists so we can have a discussion. And before we go there, uh, I would like to uh, say thank you again, a very big thank you for all the presenters and also to uh, all, all of the audience uh, who have been listening to the presentations. Um, those who are uh, in, in the panelist section, uh, I would like all of you to switch on your cameras so we can take a group picture. And after that, uh, we will switch off the live stream and the recording. And then I will still need to find the correct place to. Okay. Let's wait for Ani to close the curtain. Okay. And then how do you say uh, cheers or, or smile or cheese in Japanese? Uh, you are muted, Tomoko. Uh, yeah, we say cheese, hi cheese. <laughs> Okay, so Japanese. cheese. <laughs> okay, I hope I got some pictures. But um, thank you again. Uh, I will switch off, off the live stream and uh, uh, Tomoko or, uh, or her crew will stop the recording. Uh, it's now quarter past 12, so we will have a five minute break. And then anybody who is uh, interested in staying back for a bit, for discussion, whether you are in the audience or in the panelists, you are welcome to stay. So we will continue at uh, 20 past. <laughs>